afternoon. We're up to uh, lecture 12. So, yeah. Okay. So, at the end of last lecture on uh, last Thursday, we talked about finite differencing methods, or the first attempt of actually approximating the solution of a first order ordinary differential equation using uh, a numerical approximation method. And we, we looked at a way of approximating the derivative using a Taylor series expansion, which ends up being what we call a finite differencing approximation or finite differences, whatever way you want to call it, approximation of the first derivative. Um, that led to the Euler's method, which is a very simple method of expanding or advancing in time from time equals zero, from the initial condition. You advance in time until you get to a final destination that you preset. And along the way, you approximate the values of the solution of the function that you're trying to function, the solution of the first order ODE. So essentially, a, a, an approximation method of this kind is not, a, is not a method that will end up giving you a function itself. It doesn't give you an algebraic form, but it gives you a distribution of points, essentially, in time. It can also be done in space, as we'll see down the road. Um, but the, the first, uh, the, what, what we call the Euler method, is a first order method because it is first order accurate, or delta t to the power of one accurate, um, meaning that, um, it is not very robust. Uh, essentially, it is prone to instabilities. It is prone to inaccuracies. If you don't refine that time step size, delta t, to a very low value, then you are prone to get inaccurate results. So there's obviously different techniques to actually mitigate this error. And one of the techniques we saw was the second order method, or modified Euler method, that would actually require um, the modified Euler method requires the differentiation of the function in the, um, in the differential equation. So again, given a first order IVP composed by a governing equation, and the governing equation again, the met the y dt is equal to f of y and t. That is how we express the differential equation. So this equation is allowed to be nonlinear. It's allowed to be non-homogeneous. It's allowed to be variable coefficient. And an initial condition such that y at 0 is equal to some given value y0. Okay? We looked at <coughs> numerical approximation. using Euler's method, which is order delta t accurate. And then we looked at the modified Euler's method, which is order delta t squared accurate. All right. Now, in practice, this variant, although this variant of the Euler's method is slightly more accurate and slightly more robust, so it, it actually converges to the solution, to the right solution, to the expected solution faster. Um, it converges proportionally to delta t squared. In practice, these methods are not used. A variant of these methods based on a predictor corrector scheme can be implemented. Actually, this modified Euler is the Euler's method second order uh, 
Gotta remember the name we gave it. The second order method. Audit five would be the second order. Uh, second order. Euler's method. The first one is called the modified Euler's method. The first one of these predictor corrector schemes. This one is also delta t square accurate. And it's based on the calculation of these coefficients k1, which is equal to delta t times the function f on the right hand side of the dominant equation, evaluated at yn comma tn, k2, which is equal to delta t times the function f evaluated at yn plus k1 comma tn plus 1, and then the new solution is equal to yn plus 1 half of k1 plus k2. All right, so this uh, nomenclature is common for these predictor corrector schemes, and notice that the, the scheme is it's an explicit scheme that starts at t equals 0, or at n equals 0, and then you advance to a final n to reach a target time. And along the way, you calculate the solution at those locations. Okay? And it's completely explicit because you don't, obviously you don't need the solution at the next time level to be able to predict the solution at the new time level. Um, so you start with, t, with n equals 0, you evaluate the function f, which is a, a given function, part of the differential equation, at the initial condition y0, and at time 0, which is usually 0. Then you calculate k1, then you use that k1 to evaluate the function again at yn plus k1, and at the new time level, which you know, because you select the size of the delta t. And then the next solution, or the solution at the next time level, will be the solution at the previous time level, plus 1 half of k1 plus k2. Okay, so this is a very easy to implement that would take two lines of code methodology that does not require the evaluation of the derivatives of the function f as the second order Euler's method, so it's a little bit more practical. It is explicit, and it's order delta t square accurate, so it, it converges to the solution faster. There's a slight modification to this method that points. Points method is also delta t square accurate, so it also converges to the solution quadratically. And this method also involves the calculation of two predicted coefficients, k1, is the size of the time step, which is set by you, times the function f of a weight of yn comma tn. K2 is equal to delta t, and now the function times the function f now evaluated at yn plus two thirds of k1, comma, tn plus two thirds of delta t. So you don't evaluate it quite at the next time level, but at two thirds of the way there. And then y at n plus one is equal to yn plus one quarter of k1 plus three k2. So Hoyne's method is a slight modification to the modified Euler method. It's also second order accurate. It's just basically a weighted average of these two predicting coefficients. So this is the, predicti the predictive steps and this is the corrective step. And now by far the most widely used method to approximate the solution of initial value problems is the Runge-Kutta method. And the Runge-Kutta method is order delta t to the fourth accurate. Which means again that the, the solution converges, or the approximation converges to the exact solution, whatever that is, because technically we don't know what the exact solution is, but we know it converges to it order delta t to the power of 4. So making delta t 
half the size would improve the solution 16 times. Okay? That's what it does theoretically. It also does it in practice as long as there's convergence. If it diverges, it also diverges 16 times faster. So it will blow up <laughs> as fast as it will convert. So the predicted coefficients, k1, k2, is delta t. Tn plus one half of delta t. So halfway, this next predicted coefficient is halfway of the time step forward. K3 is delta t times f yn plus also one half of the new predictive step, Tn plus one half of delta t. K4 is equal to delta T times F by N plus K3, comma Tn plus 1, or same thing as Tn plus delta T. And the new solution is equal to the old solution plus 1 6 of K1 plus 2K2 plus 2K3 plus k4. Again, very easy to implement. Just two additional lines of code will yield a method that is far more accurate than the others. Than the others. Um, and uh, it is also explicit. So you don't need to go and come back. These predictive corrective coefficients will take care of that. All you do is start with n equals 0. At n equals 0, you know what the solution is. It's the initial condition. You use that initial condition here, well, you know what the function f is. Use the initial condition here, time equals zero. Calculate k1, then you use k1 to evaluate the function again at half the way time step forward. And if you use that to calculate k3, you use that to calculate k4. It's completely explicit. And there are many, many other approximation methods. Some of these methods are specific for some applications that require higher degree of accuracy. Some of them require combinations of degree of, of accuracy or, or order of convergency. Um, but by far, the Kuta approximation is the mo most widely used. Um, I use it continuously uh, in combination with something called Richardson, Richardson's extrapolation, which is, if, some, if we have the time, we can explain that, which is a way to actually correct the time step. It's a way to uh, implement a, a variable time stepping. So instead of using a fixed delta t, you can actually use this Richardson extrapolation to predict what the error is on your next approximation on the yn plus 1, and then go back and use the appropriate size of delta t that you need to satisfy some tolerance. Okay? So you keep going and coming back, going and coming back, it's obviously slower, but at least you know that your solution is bound to be within the exact solution by a tolerance margin that you impose. Obviously, that tolerance cannot be less than the machine precision, because then that, that gets lost in the in the uh, in the storage. But at least you have some control. This is a variable time stepping method. Um, if you are used to programming in MATLAB, for example, this Runge Kuta scheme is already pre-programmed for you. It's called RK4. Okay, so it's an implicit function in MATLAB that's called RK4, where you give a differential equation, an initial condition, you tell it what the time step size is, and it will actually evaluate using the Runge Kuta fourth order approximation, RK4. There's also RK5, which is nothing but a fifth order approximation, and there's the RK45, which is a combination of the two. And when you use two orders of approximation methods, it, out, it also provides you technically a way of predicting what the error be in relation to a tolerance. And it would actually allow you to use variable time stepping. There's another methodology that allows variable time stepping. Anyways, um, let's do an example. And this is an example that we already solved in class analytically. So given dy dt, so this is the governing equation or the differential equation dy dt is equal to the sine of 2t minus y 
the tangent of t. Okay, this equation happens to be linear. It's linear, as you can see, y is not square, it's not multiplying dy dt, dy dt is not square, it's not inside the sine or cosine, they're standalone, they're linearly combined with each other, okay? They're just multiplied by coefficients that happens to be function of time. So it's a variable coefficient equation. And it also happens to be non-homogeneous. This is what makes it non-homogeneous. This is the right-hand side term, sine of 2t. This, this equation is already written in the form where f of y and t is equal to the sine of 2t minus y times the tangent of t. That's the right-hand side function of this differential equation. And in initial condition, y of 0 is equal to 1. This was already given. Okay? So we already did this. We already solved this equation. B is that it's a linear equation. We used the integrating factors um, and found a solution. And the exact solution happens to be y of t. This is the exact particular solution. 3 cosine of t minus twice the cosine squared of t. Okay, so this, this is a solution that we found to integrating factors. It's a particular solution. We did it last class or two classes ago. Okay, so the numerical solution will require us to define a final time, let's say tf is equal to 1. Let's say that we want to advance the solution all the way to 1. And we want to do so in n time steps. Therefore, delta t, the size of the palette in the time step, is this tf divided by n. Okay, And that we decide. We decide how much computing power we have, or depending on that, well, we decide how many time steps we're going to evaluate. All we are is interested in what happens between 0 and 1 seconds. Okay, 0 and 1. We can make that final time whatever we want, but let's, let's keep it at 1. Okay? And for the sake of implementation, then, well, we need the function f of y and t. This is the function that's going to go into the algorithm, whether we use the Euler modified Euler, the um, Hoyens or runge kutta But if we use a second order Euler, we also need the derivative of these functions. Remember that the second order Euler is not implemented in practice because precisely it requires these derivatives and sometimes that function on the right hand side is not properly defined. So what is this, the derivative of that function with respect to t? The root of the sine of 2t is twice the cosine of 2t. And remember what the derivative of the tangent is? The secant square of t. And we also need the derivative of f with respect to y. The derivative of that function with respect to y is the negative of the tangent of t. Okay? So, so we start at n equals zero and advance in time by looping n all the way from zero to n, whatever n number of time steps we decide to use. All right, so I'm going to go to the computer. I'm going to change focus to the computer. If you are done writing, um, okay. All right, so I am using. For the purpose of implementing this, I'm using MATCAT. Um, you can do exactly the same in MATLAB, Maple, Mathematica. Um, you can use uh, uh, high-level programming language. 
T, so you put plus four times. At the end of the day, each of these methods is this particular code here in bars. It's just the pseudocode. And uh, I'll explain briefly how these programming flows go. But it's a very simple implementation. Yes? Do you know if the free version on the website can be supplemented into this file? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'll, I'll post a link to that version. Actually, I suggest you download the uh, Matka 15. I use, I use version 14. Uh, I suggest you use version, I think it's 14 or 13. Uh, I use 14. Uh, I think the re the uh, current one is version 15, which is 100% compatible with this one. But since MathCat was acquired by Math uh, by PTC, they created a new package called MathCat Prime. I suggest you don't download that because it has a lot of bugs. Okay, and it's not as user friendly as this one. This one's been around for for ages, and it was truly the the first what you see is what you get type of mathematical spreadsheet. Okay, you can actually write your equations on the screen, uh, create range variables, create variables, uh, evaluate, do parametric evaluation, do coding. As you can see I can do coding. It also does symbolic evaluation, and it does it, it, does it very well. Um, and it's what you see is what you get. You just get it on the screen. You don't have to call external functions. If you want to plot, you plot right away. Um, the only, obviously, there's, there's this pros, but there's cons to to MathCat. I only use it for a demonstrative tool. It's good for, as a teaching tool to show you a particular algorithm and how it works, and we can program it and, and plot it on the screen right away. I use it when I am thinking of a particular algorithm, developing an algorithm. I can test it here right away for simple cases, but it doesn't do anything complicated, okay? And it's very slow because it's an interpreter um, rather than a compiler. So it's interpreting all these equations as you, as you write them on a top to bottom approach. So if you try to use, for example, y0 before you define it, if you try to use, uh, let's say, uh, tf, I define tf here, and if I use a, an expression that requires tf, I say tf times 10, and I ask him how much is that, it's going to give me an error because it hasn't been defined. But if I move it here to the right of where I defined it, it's going to give me, well, tf times, times 10 is equal to 10. All right, so it does a parametric evaluation. You just have to keep in mind that it's top to bottom, left to right, okay? So here's what I'm doing. This is this particular code, which I'll publish on Canvas, is, uh, is essentially, let me see if I can zoom this a little bit more, yes. All right, so it's, I'm essentially using this specifically for the example that we're trying to solve. This, not, this is not a general solution method. If I change the function f, then it will become the solution of that particular ordinary differential equation. So the function f is the function on the right-hand side, which happens to be sine of 2t minus y times the tangent of t, okay? The sine and the tangent are already implicit functions. I don't need to redefine them. They already exist. So here it is. I'm going to do it again, okay? I'm, I'm going to use the f of y on t is to define a function or a number. I use column. Column will actually display column equal. That is definition. That's the definition equal. And it's equal to the sine of 2 times t minus the tangent of t. Okay, you just write it. If you press enter and nothing turns red, it's because you didn't make any mistakes. Okay? If I, for example, try to write this as, and then plus the cosine of theta, by the way, theta is q, control g, anything control g turns it into 3. So I can do alpha will be a, control g. Okay, that's alpha. If I do that, it's going to give me an error because alpha is not defined. Okay, so also t is not defined, but since it's a parameter of the function, it likes it. By the way, I'm missing the y here. So that's a function that defines the differential equation. Now we know that the exact solution happens to be this. Okay, y of t is equal to 3 cosine of t minus 2 times the cosine square of t. Okay. I can plot that right away, but I choose not to because I'm going to plot it later on when I perform the, uh, the numerical solutions. Okay? Now, in order to compare this analytical solution, notice that the analytical solution is an algebraic form. It's a general solution that is valid for all values of t. Okay? In order to compare it to a, analytic, to a numerical solution, I need to create a vector or an array of values of y at predefined values of t. Okay? 
So I am saying that the final value of time that I'm interested in knowing the solution at is one. I can change that to whatever number I want, but I'm just interested in knowing the solution from time equals zero to time equal one. Okay? By the way, here's the initial condition. I call it y zero. This zero here, or O, is not an index, it's just a subscript. Just part of the title. I can call it y o, like that, or I can just call it y dot o. When you say dot, it automatically brings it down to as a sub-index. Okay? It's not, uh, it's just part of the title. It's not part of the range. So I'm going to say tf, which is also an index of t. It's, I'm sorry, it's, it's just a sub-index, sub a subscript. Sorry, a subscript, not a sub-index of t is equal to 1. I'm going to break the interval from 0 to 1 seconds into 10 steps. And the size of the time step, delta t, which, by the way, delta is nothing but capital D, control G. Okay? Control G turns everything into, into Greek. <coughs> it's Ds divided by n. All right? 0 0.1. Is that enough? Well, we don't know. We don't know if that's enough resolution. We don't know if that time step will lead to solutions that are inaccurate. All I know is that if I use the first order method, Euler's first order, and I make delta D half of that, the solution should be about half accurate or it should be twice as accurate. If I make delta D a quarter of that, then the solution should be four times as accurate. But if I use the second order method, then that would be quadratically approaching the exact solution. And I know, and I can actually assess that accuracy because I know the exact solution. Obviously, this is a, a, class, a classroom problem where we know the exact solution. Normally, we will implement this method in cases where we don't know the exact solution. Otherwise, approximation methods will not exist. All right. Now, because I am going to implement this method using also the second order Euler where I need the derivatives, I am defining this function df dt, which I can define that way, or I can, uh, I can go back here and say, well, I'm going to copy this here. By the way, you can copy and paste. And I'm going to um, underline the t, and I'm going to go symbolics, variable, Differentiate. This is just going to differentiate, symbolically differentiate on that variable t. And there it is. It is a cosine of 2t minus y times the tangent squared plus 1, which is a secant squared. Okay, it doesn't do the identity for you, but the tangent squared plus 1 is a secant squared. And that's equivalent to this. See? Or I can go ahead and I'm going to delete this. And I can under, underline this variable y and go symbolic variable differentiate. And that gives you minus the tangent. So it does a partial differentiation for me if I don't want to bother with that. Right? That's cheating, yeah. You could use that on the test. It's open books, open everything. So I can, you can take this entire thing and, uh, and I can say, well, let me cheat even better. I'm going to say derivative with respect to, let's say, t of f of y and t, which already exist, and I'm going to go here, symbolic, evaluate symbolic. It doesn't like it. Mm, it, doesn't, it doesn't like to do it that way. Okay, so stick to the variable differentiation. There's also a way to do the entire Can do derivative with respect to t of this whole thing, and then I can evaluate symbolic, evaluate symbolic. There it is. Okay? So I can do partial derivatives every which way you want. Yeah, I, I try to do it directly on the function, and it doesn't like it. it doesn't like to do it on the function. I'm going to delete all of this. All right, I did it by hand, and the FDT is this. So I am defining a function that's just called the FDT. It's not implying that I'm differentiating f with respect to t. I'm just defining the function the FDT, which happens to be the derivative of this function with respect to t. And the FDY happens to be the derivative of this function with respect to y. So I already did it by hand. All right, I already predefined what uh, I predefined what n is. I said I'm going to use 10, which since my target time is one second. My delta t is 0 0.1. I don't know if that's enough. All right? So, the first order method, this is the first order Euler method. 
What do I do? I am going to create an array called y, and I'm going to return that value of y to an array called y1, so that when I, after the evaluation, I'm going to do it after this is defined, y1, again, y1 is just a subscript, it's not a subindex. Then I say equal, so this is a range variable with the solution. Okay? If I make n equal 20, then that range variable we have will have 20 entries. It will be a vector from 1 to 20, or from 0 to 20. Right? All right, so this is it's very simple. This programming toolbar is very straightforward. I am looping, I'm first assigning the first value, and this is actually a subindex of y. Sorry. In this case, it's y left bracket accesses the subindex not the subscript. The zeroth entry of that array is going to be y0, which is defined here as the initial condition. Then I'm looping n from 0 to big N. I'm going to go back to 10. Okay. And this is the standard Euler. I'm, I'm, I'm implementing the standard Euler and the nomenclature that I use for the predictive corrector, but there's no prediction and corrector. This is straightforward Euler where y at n plus 1 is equal to y at n plus delta t times f evaluated at the previous time step. That's it. So this should yield an array which is called y1, that is, or we can call it y, y Euler, whichever way we want to, I call it y1 because it's first order. That's an array that has 10 entries, 11 entries, from 0 to 10, with the approximate, approximation solution. I am also creating an array called ye for exact, that has 11 entries as well, that is the evaluation of the exact solution y at all the discrete values of time. See? And the reason I create that array is because then later I wanna, I wanna compare apples to apples. I wanna compare the evaluation of the exact solution at all these values of time with the evaluation of the approximate solution at all those values of time. All right, this is the, mod, the, the uh, second order Euler as we wrote it last class. The second order Euler is delta t f times delta t squared over 2 times those, those derivatives of the function that defines the ordinary differential equation. This is the modified Euler. I call it yme. So at the end of the execution of this loop, yme is going to be an array, y dot me, that has 11 entries, starting from the initial condition because that's the first one I set up all the way to 10 or 11, because that's the final time step. All right, and this one is predictive corrective. I do k1, k2, and use those to correct the solution y at n plus 1. Then the Hoynes, which is two-thirds of the step, of the corrective step, and uses two-thirds of the predictive step, uses two-thirds of the first step. And then the Runge Kuta, I call it yrk, which also uses four coefficients for prediction and then one step for correction. Okay, this is exactly as we wrote it in the notes. At the end of the day, I have five arrays. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plot it. You can plot it directly on the screen. Okay, so I'm gonna plot, since n is already, lowercase n is already a range variable that loops between zero and n, okay? It accesses all the entries of this array T, and it accesses all the entries of these arrays. Exact, first order, second order, modified Euler, points, and Rumi Kuta. And as you can see, the dashed blue line is not very accurate. The light blue line is, well, when I say accurate, it's because I know the exact solution. The exact solution is the red one that you don't see because it's right underneath the black one. Okay? And the black one happens to be the Runge Kuta, which is the more accurate of all. So even with so very few time steps, because here we only have 10 time steps, from 0 to 1 seconds and steps of 0 0.1 seconds, the Runge Kuta does a really good job of predicting the solution. This is a quanti uh, qualitative representation of the, of the solution, of how accurate it is. If we want a quantitative representation, we calculate a residual which is nothing but a standard deviation of the numerical solution to the exact solution. 
Since we know the exact solution, then we can obviously calculate a residual. This is also called an L2 norm. Okay, it's a sum of the squares between of the differences between the exact solution and the numerical solution. Okay, and I sum all those, all those squares, divided by the number of steps, take the square root of that to make this a standard deviation, and then I also scale it. I scale it to the range of exact solution. The maximum minus the minimum exact solution in that range from zero to one. So that I can get a non-dimensional assessment of how accurate the solution is. And whatever that number I get, whatever that number I get, I'm going to just simply attach a percentage to it on the right hand side. And that's 11%. So the deviation, the global deviation of the first order Euler's method to the exact solution is 11%. The second order, 2.5%. The modified Euler, 1.9%. The Hoynes is 0.4%. And the Runge Kuta, notice, 0.002%. It's already extremely accurate, even though I'm using a very large time step. Okay? It is a, granted, it's a linear equation, and you are bound to, to be accurate, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. If I make delta t half, so what do we have? We had the first order method had 11.5%. If I make delta t half of what it used to be, that error should go to about 5.56%. Okay, so that's not exact, it's the order of magnitude. Let's see. If I make delta t, the number times that 20, which will make delta t 0.05, so I'm still evaluating from 0 to 1 seconds. I'm just going in more steps. I don't need to modify the algorithms. The solution, as you can see, qualitative, qualitatively gets better. And quantitatively, if I go here and F9 will be update, 5.3%. It's about half. Actually, a little bit better than half. Okay? This one went from 2.4 to 0.6. Okay. That one didn't improve by, by by two, it improved by four, because this is a second order accurate method, okay? This one should also improve by four, F9, 0.44, yes. This one should also improve by four, so we should get about 0 0.1. There it is, 0 0.1, 0 0.096. And this one should improve by 16, because it's fourth order accurate. And by 16, we should get 0, 0 0.0, another order of magnitude there. There it is, one more position to the right, okay? And we can keep improving this by just simply increasing the number of time steps. I'm going to make it 100. And some of these solutions are going to be indistinguishable from each other. Except the blue one still diverging a little bit because that's the first order accurate solution. And the first order accurate solution, F9, although it's quality, it's only 1% off, right? But these ones, notice, two orders of magnitude better. And this one is going to be several orders of magnitude better, 10 to the minus 7 percent. It's virtually the exact solution. Now that will change dramatically if we, because of the nature of these functions, the nature of these equations is highly oscillative. Okay, this is an equation that is driven by trigonometric functions. Okay, and the solution, as you can see, is trigonometric. We have a cosine and a cosine squared. So if we evaluate past one second, let's say we evaluate past two, three periods. We're going to see oscillations going up and down, okay? And then the solutions method, whichever it is, is going to end up having some problem. Let's see if, what happens when we evaluate this to uh, four seconds. And I'm going to keep n at, uh, at 100, which will make a delta t of 0 0.04. Let's make, it, let's make it even better. Let's make it 400. So delta t is 0 0.01, okay? See how off it is? Well... The light blue line, which is the second order Euler method, is apparently doing the best job. The black line is going to eventually get there. Okay? But it's good up until about one second, and then they start diverging from each other. It's not, that the, it's not that the algorithms are incorrect. It's just that they have a hard time catching up. Since these are predictive method, they tend to lag behind the exact solution. And when the solution changes mono, monotonicity, basically the solution goes from growing to decreasing, then it has a hard time catching up except the second order method because it uses the derivative of the function. It is not a practical method, but it's very accurate.
Okay, so if I go back and say this, I want to use 4,000 points. Yeah, it will get better. Well, that all changes when I go to 10 seconds. If I go to 10 seconds, and let me keep this at 1,000 points, which will make delta T 0 0.01. Since the solution is highly oscillative, they have a hard time, really hard time catching up. Notice the light blue. That's the second order method. It's only second order, but it's very accurate. Okay? It converges to the solution quadratically, but it's already accurate. So changing the delta T will just make it more accurate. The Runge Kuta, the black line is off from the red line. See, actually the Hoens is doing a little bit better, especially on this region, especially on this far tail end right here. But as you make delta T smaller, this one is bound to get close to it. Okay, so the modified Eulers is horrible. But I'm going to make N 10,000. Now the delta T is a millisecond. See, they're all getting close to the exact solution except the magenta one, the modified Euler, which doesn't seem to be happy about anything. All right, but if I do make N equal 100,000, this might take a while to evaluate. See, well, it actually diverged. Unable to plot this many points. Okay, it doesn't like to plot 100,000 points. Um, but the solution, let's, let's look at, at, at the residuals. This residual, it's okay, 0.4%, 2 times this, as expected, is the best one, 0.36%, 0 0.05, it's okay, 0.29%, even through four oscillations there. It doesn't like that many points, let's make it 50,000 to see what it does. There it is. See, now even the magenta line is trying to catch up, and the... And, uh, and the Runge Kuta line is right there with the it's right there with the uh, with the exact solution. Okay, so this is this uh, implementation. Let me go back to the notes. Are there any questions here? Um, you're free to. There are going to be some exercises on the homework that will require you to do things like this. I'm gonna I'm gonna post this on Canvas. You will have access to this to this file. It's a very simple program that you can implement, you can just change the function f and get an answer. Now, you're not bound by this software, you don't, you're not required to learn this software, you can use whatever you want. You can even do it in C and send that code listing to me with, a, with, the, uh, with the homework assignment, and uh, that will be valid. All right, so let me, uh, let me save, Actually, let me bring it back to 10, leave it like that, save. Okay, so let me go back to, any questions? Okay, so let me go back to, all right, so now what do we do when we have a system of First order of these systems of first order of these. Often engineering problems. system of coupled. Coupled means that you cannot solve one equation without solving the other. Okay, so that's why they become a system. You have to solve them simultaneously. Ordinary differential equations where the unknowns and the unknowns are, well, y1 of t, y2 of t, y3 T, etc., etc., represent the state variables of specific instances in the field, 
by E. Current and voltages in an electric circuit. So if we have an electric circuit with different meshes and different elements of solenoids and, and resistors and, um, and, and capacitors, then every branch or every line has a different voltage or current, and every one of them can be represented by a state variable, which is part of a coupled set of ordinary differential equations. We can have different flows and pressures in a, a hydraulic system. We can have a piping system, and then these state variables can be represented by flows and pressures. We can have uh, location of different points in a kinematic mechanism, etc. So this state variables y1, y2, y3, etc. can represent pretty much anything. So given, let's say, the equations can be expressed in this form, dy1 dt of t is equal to f1 of t, y1, y2, all the way to yn, dy2 dt equal to some function 2 of t, y1, y2, all the way to yn. And finally, dyn dt of t equals to fn of t, y1, y2, well, the fact that that function f that defines the ordinary differential equation 1 is a function of all the other state variables is what makes it coupled. So it makes it necessary to solve all of them simultaneously. You cannot solve the first equation without knowing the solution of the second one and so on and so forth. And then we can collapse these into d dt of f, I'm sorry, of y of t. vector is equal to f vector of t comma y vector. <coughs> All right, so this is the vector form of that particular system. We also need a set of initial conditions. system is linear, the solution exists and it is unique. So there is indeed a solution, a solution, a particular solution to the system of equations that is of the form y of t equals y1 of t, y2 of t. So we have n functions, okay? Not just a single one, 
So in this case, a particular solution is represented by n functions because we have n equations. A linear ODE system can be expressed as so we'll have dy1 dt of t is equal to a11 of t. This can be a variable coefficient y1 of t plus a12 of t times y2 of t plus a y n one n of t times y n of t plus some function g one of t d y two d t of t is equal to some other independent coefficient to one of t y one of t plus a two two of t y two of t plus a to n of t, y n of t, plus some independent function, g2 of t. Go all the way down to <coughs> dyn dt. is equal to a n1 of t, y1 of t plus a and 2 of t, y2 of t, plus a and n of t, y n of t, plus some g n of t. Or, in compact form, we have y of t dot, that's the derivative of each of the state variables, is equal to the coefficients a of t which is now a coefficient matrix. So each of these coefficients are part of this coefficient matrix. Y of t plus <coughs> g of t. And this is how we express linear systems of ODE. So this is a linear system of all right. Such that y dot of t is equal to dy one dy2 dt dyn dt y of t again is simply y1 of t y2 of t yn of t and g of t equal to these are known forcing functions or whatever they represent. Okay. The coefficient matrix A of T 
is equal to A11 of T, A12 of T, A1N of T, A21 of T, A22 of T, A2N of T, AN1 of T, AN2 of T, AN of T. This coefficient matrix can be fully populated. There can be a bunch of zeros. That means that it's sparse. Nonetheless, it's just coefficient matrix. And it's, as you can see, allowed to have coefficients that are a function of time. Now, if g of t is equal to 0, what do we call the system of equations? Right? Homogeneous. That's the right-hand side function. On a single ODE, that would be the right-hand side function. That's an independent term. Mm -hmm. In a system of ODEs, it's the same story. Then system of ODEs is homogeneous. If A of T is just equal to A, constant values, okay, not all, not, obviously not all have to be the same, but they're just constant, they're not a function of T, system of ODEs is constant coefficient. Okay? And therefore, the system y of t equals to a times y of t is a linear homogeneous constant coefficient system of ODEs. Okay. All right, this is a system that we're going to be concentrating on for finding analytical solutions. Numerical solutions, it can be whatever system. It can be a nonlinear variable coefficient, non-homogeneous. But for analytical solutions, we're restricted to these types of systems. We can find superpositions to get solutions of non-homogeneous systems, but the method that the general method that we'll establish will find the solution of these system of ODEs. Okay, so every equation of the system of ODEs is very simple. It's a first order homogeneous constant coefficient equation. If I give you a, a homogeneous equation, right, or set of equations, let's say I give you a, a homogeneous equation, a single homogeneous equation, and I give you an initial condition that is also homogeneous, meaning that it's zero, what would the solution be? Think about it. If I give you a homogeneous equation, If a given ODE of the form dy dt is equal to, let's say, a times y, again, that's linear, homogeneous, so on and so forth, constant coefficient ODE is given. And with an initial condition, with an hom a homogeneous, a homogeneous IC, such that Y of zero is equal to zero. Homogeneous means that it's equal to zero. What is the solution? What is the solution? YT. Well, let's try it. 
What is the solution to this equation? By integrating factors. <coughs> the general solution by integration factor, remember? e to the negative t times c times e to the minus a negative t, right? So it's a constant. Y of t is equal to e to the, so it's a constant times a t, right? This general solution will satisfy this equation, right? What is the derivative of this with respect to t? Is c times minus a, c times minus a, you see, it's a plus or minus? So it would be plus, right? C times minus a, the minus a is equal to a times c times plus a. Okay. That is the general solution. Yeah, yeah, because the uh, the integration factor goes in the denominator as minus a t, so it goes to the numerator as positive a t. Okay. So that's definitely the solution to this equation. Now apply the initial condition. <coughs> That says that y of 0 is equal to 0, which is equal to c times e to the 0. Right? e to the a times 0 is e to the 0. How much is e to the 0? 1. Therefore, c is equal to what? 0. So the solution, when you plug it in here, particular solution, <coughs> y of t is equal to 0. This is called a trivial solution. Okay? But we don't want that. So if you have a homogeneous equation and a homogeneous condition, you'll always get a trivial solution, regardless <coughs> of the nature of the equation. How well, it has to be linear. If it's not linear, you might not get a trivial solution. So, therefore, if the system, the homogeneous system, is given as y dot t is equal to a times y of t, At least one initial condition must be non-zero for the solution <coughs> i of t to be non-trivial. So we need to be given at least one non-zero initial condition. Otherwise, you know that the solution is going to be trivial. And that means that y of t not equal to just a bunch of zeros. All right. So let's go back to the single ODE <coughs> to attempt to construct a solution for this equation. So an analytical... solution of this equation, of this system, may be attempted by recognizing that a single ODE, single ODE, And dy dt of t is equal to a times y of t has general solution y of t is equal to c times e to the a t. Okay. 
Therefore, it may be inferred that the solution of the system is y of t is equal to some x times e to the gamma t. So we get the resolution of this form where x is going to be the unknown coefficients that we can determine through initial conditions. And gamma is going to, are going to be the exponents or the powers, which we will find short. So first, plug these trial solution, trial solution back into the system of ODEs. So that y of t dot is equal to a times y of t such that since y of t is equal to x times e to the gamma t the derivatives with respect to time of y would be what? gamma times x times e to the gamma t. So I'm going to plug them back in here. So I'm going to have gamma times x times e to the gamma t is equal to a times x times e to the gamma t. So this one and this one cancel out, and what I'm left with is a times x is equal to gamma times x. So we'll solve for gamma and x. Well, solving for gamma and x will be the solution to the system of equations. going to perform the solution, but let me list some concluding notes for today's lecture. The system above is an eigenvalue problem. We'll define what that is and how to solve it next class. An eigenvalue problem where Gamma is an eigenvalue and x is the corresponding eigenvector. Okay, so this system right here is by definition known as an eigenvalue problem. Because as you can see, you can cancel out lambda x with x. This is an x. This is not a lambda. And this will lead to a trivial solution for lambda and a trivial solution for x. But there exist very specific values called also the characteristic values. I can value another word for characteristic. In German, it's automatic value. So these are some specific characteristic values of lambda, which are the resonance values of this matrix, essentially, that will make this possible and non-trivial. That's what an eigenvalue problem is. That system right there, if I pick x equals 0, that's the solution for that system. Whatever a is, whatever that matrix a is, picking a vector x that is full of zeros will satisfy this equation. So this is a trivial problem, okay? where x is equal to 0 and lambda is equal to 0. However, there exist some specific characteristic values lambda that would make it possible for these to, have, to not have a trivial solution. Okay? And those are called the characteristic values, those are called the eigenvalues, those are called the outer values, those are also called 
the um, resonance one. Okay, so there will be there will be as many eigen values lambdas and corresponding eigenvector x as the size n of the system. So if you have 20 equations, you're going to have 20 eigenvalues and 20 x's. Okay? That's guaranteed. The eigenvalues are not necessarily always real values. That means they can be complex. However, if A is a positive definite matrix, positive definite matrix, then all eigenvalues are real and positive. That's all we need to know. Okay? So we'll be dealing with positive definite matrix. What is a positive definite matrix? Well, there's a specific definition for that. Okay? It has to the diagonals have to be greater than the, diag the diagonal to the power of n has to be greater than the sum of the off diagonals or the absolute values of the off diagonals. And there are other conditions. Any matrix that is a result of the multiplication of another matrix times its transpose, it is always positive definite, but it's more of a linear algebra issue. Okay? In our case, we're interested in systems of equations that yield a matrix that is positive definite that yields positive and real eigenvalues so that we can solve the problem. Otherwise, the solution of the system will be in terms of complex variables, which means that we'll have a real and an imaginary component, and uh, that will make things a lot more complicated because remember that we are seeking a solution of the form this. What if lambda, or I'm sorry, gamma, is not a real value? What is if, it, if it's a complex var va value? Remember the Euler's identity? What is the e to the gamma i, or the lambda i? It's a sine and a cosine, right? So instead of having exponential solutions, we'll have trigonometric solutions. Okay? So that's also possible directly through this release of tense here. All right, so let's stop right here. And when we get back on Thursday, we'll actually solve the eigenvalue problem, have an example, and do a numeric as well. Okay?